the newspapers of British North America are small-scale operations with a great capacity to provoke and irritate the powerful. This is the age of the partisan press. All through the colonies in Halifax, Quebec, Montreal and York, opposition journalists attack what they consider an arbitrary, self-appointed colonial regime. Whatever goes to extend or to secure the advantages which of right ought to flow to the people, we shall steadily and fearlessly uphold. But these early muckrakers will pay a high price. In York, the capital of Upper Canada, a gang of thugs destroys the presses of the colonial advocate. Its editor, William Lyon Mackenzie, has been heaping scorn on the colony's leaders. The family connection rules Upper Canada. A dozen nobodies and a few placemen, pensioners, and individuals of well-known, narrow, and bigoted principles. The whole of the revenue of Upper Canada are, in reality, at their mercy. They are paymasters, receivers, auditors, king, lords, and commons. Mackenzie denounces this circle of appointees that surrounds the governor as the family compact. He identifies them by name, exposes their family connections, publishes their income. One of his chief targets is the Attorney General, John Beverly Robinson. Another reptile has sprung up in a Mr. William Mackenzie, a conceited red-headed fellow with an apron. He said that I am the most subtle advocate of arbitrary power. What vermin. Mackenzie installs new presses and continues his crusade. The step to direct involvement in politics, election to the Legislative Assembly, is a small one. I'd long seen the country in the hands of a few shrewd, crafty, covetous men, under whose management one of the most lovely and desirable sections of America remained a comparative desert. The most obvious improvements were stayed. Dissension was created among classes, and large estates were wrested from their owners in utter contempt of even the forms of the courts. In Nova Scotia, another rabble-rousing journalist takes aim at his colony's unelected rulers. Halifax is the gateway to the Atlantic colonies and a military stronghold. Joseph Howe, editor of the Nova Scotian, is the son of a loyalist, but no friend of the local elite. His newspaper accuses them of stealing public money. In a young and poor country, where the sons of rich and favored families alone receive education at the public expense, where the many must toil to support the extortions and exactions of a few. Where the hard earnings of the people are lavished on an aristocracy who repay their ill-timed generosity with contempt and insult. It requires no ordinary nerve in men of moderate circumstances and humble pretensions to stand forward and boldly protest against measures which are fast working the ruin of the province. All rise. His Lordship, the Chief Justice, Brenton Halliburton, presiding. The leaders of the colony drag Howe into court on the criminal charge of defamatory libel. I know them as you know them. As the most negligent and imbecile, if not the most reprehensible body that ever mismanaged a people's affairs. They may expect much from the result of this trial. But before I have done with them, I hope to convince them that it is they, and not I, that are the real criminals here. 
When Howe is acquitted by a jury, his popularity is greater than ever, and like Mackenzie, he goes into politics. We are desirous of a change, not such as shall divide us from our brethren across the water, but which will ensure to us what they enjoy. Gentlemen, all we ask is what exists at home in England, a system of responsibility to the people. The governor's men in Quebec City, the power center of Lower Canada, are also coming under attack. Two journalists have dared to criticize the Legislative Council. It is appointed by the governor and blocks almost every law the elected assembly passes. They are sentenced to 40 days in jail for defamatory libel. Daniel Tracy, an Irishman, is editor of The Vindicator. Ludger Duvernay, a French-Canadian, publishes the newspaper La Minerve. As the present Legislative Council is perhaps our greatest nuisance, we ought to seize the means to rid ourselves of it and demand its abolition. Both newspapers speak for the Parti Patriote, a group of Canadian legislators and their supporters. They control the elected, but largely powerless, Legislative Assembly. Their leader's name is Louis-Joseph Papineau. The votes and measures adopted every day by the councillors may only be explained by their impassioned hatred of the Canadian, their insatiable lust for money, and their odious selfishness. Papineau is a lawyer and a seigneur. Early in his career, he was an admirer of the British Constitution. But years of struggle with an appointed governor have made him an advocate of American-style democracy. I do not believe it possible to be happy and fairly treated under the colonial system. How can a governor act justly? Even one who sincerely desires to do so when he is surrounded by such a pack of scoundrels. It is certain that in a time not long from now, all of America must become Republican. We need only to know that we live in America and to know in what condition we have lived there. Louis-Joseph Papineau, William Lyon Mackenzie, Joseph Howe. Three men inspired by the democratic ferment sweeping Europe and the Americas, determined to change a hidebound political system, one way or another. Montreal in 1832 is the economic heart of the two Canadas. 27,000 people live here, half French-speaking and half English. Commerce is controlled by a handful of English-speaking merchants and industrialists, men like John Molson and Peter McGill. That spring, political rivals gather on the Place d'Armes in a bitterly contested by-election. On one side, the English party. It backs the governor and his appointed advisors. On the other, the Patriot, mostly French Canadians and Irish immigrants who share their distrust of British authority. There is no secret ballot. Every voter must declare his or her allegiance publicly. My name is Marie Roy. I am a widow and I'm going to vote for the Patriot candidate, Daniel Tracy. My name is Pierre Picard. The 
poll remains open as long as voters continue to come forward. Léon Charlebois, innkeeper. I vote for the Patriot Party. Léon Fournier, Mason. An election can go on for weeks. This one will last 22 days. Thomas Nolan, I'm a grocer. April 26. It being 10 o'clock in the morning, the poll has not yet been able to open due to the tumult going on outside. May 21st. The Patriot candidate has taken a narrow lead. Emotions are running high. The polls go! Gracie ahead by three votes! Three French Canadians are mortally wounded. Casimir Chauvin, Pierre Billet, and Francois Languedoc. The next day, the Patriot candidate is declared victorious. Louis-Joseph Papineau expresses his outrage to the governor, Lord Aylmer. My heart is filled with sadness. And my letter will find you in the same state as you will already have heard about yesterday's disastrous events that caused bloodshed in our streets. The troops sent to protect His Majesty's subjects fired upon them. Canada has never before been afflicted with such miseries. A few weeks later, more misery for the beleaguered colony. The Carrick, arriving from Ireland, docks in Quebec City with several feverish passengers on board. Three days later, cholera claims its first victim. The disease spreads like wildfire, quickly reaching Montreal. June 14, 1832. Since Monday morning, Montreal is in turmoil, and the alarm is growing every minute. There is no longer doubt that cholera is present. We recommend that the public observe strictly the regulations of the Board of Health. The epidemic is out of control. Hundreds of victims die each day, especially in the cities. The poor districts are ideal breeding grounds for the disease. No sewers. No collection of garbage, contaminated water. There is no use in becoming alarmed. When the illness appears, one must see a doctor at once and should follow his instructions. The apothecary is of all the remedies in stock. Their prices are affordable to all pocketbooks. But in fact, the doctors are overwhelmed and powerless. They believe cholera is transmitted by foul vapors that spread through the atmosphere. Hoping to purify the tainted air, soldiers fire off cannon blasts, and the Board of Health sets barrels of tar on fire. Alexander Hart, a Jewish merchant in Montreal, sees death all around him. None of us go into town anymore. Many are moving into the country. Yesterday, 34 corpses passed our house. Today, 23. Not counting those in the old burial ground and in the Catholic ground. 12 carts are employed by the Board of Health to carry away the dead who are interred without prayers. 
cholera claims 9,000 victims, more than half in Lower Canada.